I will be speaking on angle evaluation, uh, which includes gonioscopy, ASOCT, and UVM. So if you look into angle evaluation, it, it has both subjective assessment, which includes gonioscopy, and uh, objective assessment uh, as in ASOCT and UVM. So if you coming on to gonioscopy, it is the current gold standard, although there are inter-observer variability, and there are different lenses also. So if you, uh, gonioscopy is basically a clinical technique which is used to examine the structures of the anterior chamber angle and Trantas used the limbal indentation technique in an eye with keratoglobus and he first visualized the anterior chamber angle in a live human being and the term gonio scopy was coined by him, gonios meaning the angle and scopy means to visualize. So if you look into the principle, the normal angle of the eye is not visible due to total internal reflection. Okay, so that is why we need a gonioscope or a gonio mirror to cut this uh, uh, angle of uh, refraction. And depending on the type of uh, gonioscope that we are using, we have the direct and the indirect technique. So in the direct gonioscope, as the name suggests, there is a gonio lens that is sitting there and you can visualize the angle that you are seeing. So if you are visualizing the superior angle, you will see the superior angle versus the indirect gonioscope, which is using a mirror. So if you are seeing the superior angle, it will show you the inferior because the mirror will reflect the opposite angle. So there are different types of gonioscope. The most commonly is the KP's gonio lens and depending on the size of the eye, we have different sizes. We have the Barkans. And lately, the Swan Jacob gonioscope is into vogue because now a lot of angle surgeries are being done. So this is a small video clip wherein we are putting a coupling agent and then as in we put the lens, this is a case of primary congenital glaucoma, we can see the high anterior insertion along with few iris processes and you can see a goniotomy being done. So in indirect gonioscopes, the most common is the Goldman single and double mirror. And for residents, residents, I think you should invest in the Goldman double mirror to start with. Then we have the Goldman three mirror, which has three lenses for various, uh, uh, not only for the angle, but also for the mid periphery and the equator. So this is the thumb uh, rule, which you can uh, memorize. Then we have the Zeiss four mirror. Again, it will have four mirrors to visualize. So indirect technique, that is the normal gonioscopy that we are doing like, like with a Goldman mirror. So after putting a coupling agent and explaining the patient, anesthetizing the eye, we put in the gonioscope and we have to make a thin slit beam. So the most important thing is that it is uh, this gonioscopy is like a semi-dark room procedure. It should be done in a dimly lit room because any kind of uh, flashlight or any, you know, wide light will cause the pupil to constrict and will open, falsely open the angles. So the use of direct gonioscope as I've shown is a more panoramic view and it will directly show the angle that you're viewing during surgery. So in all these angle based surgeries, we are using the direct gonioscopes versus the indirect gonioscopes that we are using on the OPD basis for the clinical diagnosis of open and closed angle glaucoma. So next, they'll always ask you what are the indications of gonioscopy. So two things you have to remember, there is a diagnostic indication and a therapeutic indication. So diagnostic, the most important thing after doing gonioscopy, we want to know whether the angle is closed or open. And in, once it is closed, we want to classify whether it's an angle, you know, uh, in PSCD, whether it's suspect or EPAC or a PSCD to identify plateau iris, to identify secondary causes of ang abnormal angle pigmentation, pseudo exfoliation, angle recession. And also pay cases wherein our trabeclectomy, fistula, uh, trabeclectomy has failed to know the cause of failure to see uh, glaucoma drainage devices and also in congenital glaucomas. So in therapeutic, we are mainly using for laser trabeculoplasties. We are using for all the angle-based surgeries like goniotomy, gonioplasty, trabectome. For reopening of the blocked ostium, you first have to see, use the gonioscope, see whether where it is blockage for indentation gonioscopy to break an attack of angle closure glaucoma. So as I've shown you, the first thing that we do, we make a slit beam. And after making the slit beam, we have to make a corneal wedge. So first thing you should look at the corneal wedge. So what is corneal wedge? Corneal wedge is actually, you can see there are two, uh, you know, two rays of light that are converging at the end. So these two rays of light, one is from the posterior surface of the cornea and one is from the anterior surface of the cornea. And they converge at the corneoscleral junction and the corneoscleral junction 
is the mark of the is is the Schwalbe's line, which is a marking of the anterior border of the trabecular meshwork, which is non-pigmented. So we don't see that part. We usually can see the pigmented part of the trabecular meshwork. So this is this landmark is very important. Depending on this, this landmark, we we follow this landmark and we will differentiate whether it's open or closed. So corneal wedge is therefore useful technique to identify the trabecular meshwork. So it is helpful, especially in cases wherein there are post-inflammatory, you know increased pigmentation like in this the wedge is forming somewhere here okay and you can see that the pigmentation is more anterior to it and also in very pale angles where there are hypopigmented angles there you can see that the wedge is being here and the you can see the rest of the uh, iris and structures are low below it so next structure that you should know is about ciliary body band so if you look into the gonioscopy, when we are doing gonioscopy, we are going from the anterior to the posterior. So the th first thing is the root of the iris that you can see. Then you can see the ciliary body band, which is basically between brownish, dark brownish in our population. And this ciliary body band is actually the result of insertion of the iris into the ciliary body. And uh, physiologically, what you should know is that physiologically, wider, it is wider in cases of myopes and na narrower in cases of hyperopes. Next, after the ciliary body, we have the scleral spur. So what is scleral spur? It is basically this prominent white line that you can see between uh, the uh, brown ciliary body band and the uh, pigmented part of trabecular meshwork. This is actually the posterior lip of the scleral sulcus, which is attached to the ciliary body posteriorly and the cornea scleral meshwork anteriorly. Then we have the uh, trabecular meshwork, which has again in two parts. One is the pigmented part like this and what anterior to it is the non-pigmented part. So the pigmented part is important for us because it's the functional part. It is the primary site of the aqueous outflow. And the anterior non-pigmented part is anterior to it. And lastly, the Schwalbe's line, which is basically a junction between the anterior chamber angle structures and cornea where the decimates membrane terminate. And it is again the landmark for trabecular meshwork in narrower angles. So this is like a heavily pigmented uh, sample is designed, which is basically a heavily pigmented uh, pigmentation where you can see which is much anterior to the Schwalbe's line. Then you can see a very prominent uh, uh, Schwalbe's line and which is anteriorly also uh, displaced like a, in a posterior embryotoxon in cases of an axon field rigor. Then apart from the angle, you also have to look at the iris, whether the iris contour is concave like seen in shallow AC or it is convex like in cases of deep AC or pigment dispersion or, or abnormal peripheral thick roll like in cases of plateau iris. And apart from that, one should know what is the difference between the iris process and a peripheral anterior synechia. So if you look at these iris processes, these are filiform, fine filiform finger-like projections that follow the contour of the angle recess. When you magnify it, you can see that they are following, they are following the curve versus a per peripheral anterior synechia, which are broad-based, thick beam-like structures. And you cannot see the structures beyond this pass. Also, you should know what is an abnormal va new vascularization, which is uh, important to diagnose new vascular glaucoma at a very early stage and manage uh, do and management at an early stage. So these uh, uh, new vascular new vascularized vessels are fine, arborizing, and they cross the scleral spur. So in apart from this, you should also know what is manipulative gonioscopy. So it is a special maneuver to see beyond steep irises. So one just ask the patients to look down or look up, look into direction of the mirror. So th that way you can see the part of the angle which is not visible in the primary position. And mo uh, one more important is indentation gonioscopy. So for this, you need a four mirror gonioscope, which has a small contact diameter. So it is important to, uh, indentation is important to know whether it's a appositional or it is a synechal closure. And when iris covers the trabecular meshwork, it is easy, very easy to mistake the non-pigmented trabecular meshwork for scleral spur. So when you indent it, the entire angle will open and you will come to know the structures that are seen. So this is how uh, 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 the uh, gonio lens is put. And just a gentle, you have to gently press it. And you can see that if you once the angle opens, you can see these broad-based uh, peripheral anterior synechia, suggesting that this is a synechial closure. 
Also, it is helpful in uh, to diagnose these uh, plateau iris uh, cases where you can see the sine wave pattern. One should know about occludable angles. So, occludable angle is uh, defined as one in which the posterior pigmented trabecular meshwork is not visible in more than 180 degrees of angle in primary position without any indentation or manipulation. So, this is how it is. This is more likely to be an occludable angle versus this angle which is totally open. You can see all the structures of the of the angle here. So, once you do the gonioscopy, what should one ask? So, once you do the gonioscopy, you have to see whether the angle is open or not. So, if you can see the scleral spur, yes, the angle is open. If you cannot see it, then you have to ask whether it's a sinic whether it's a sinical closure or an appositional closure. So, if we look, if we do an indentation, you will come to know there's a sinicae, it's a sinical closure. If there is no uh, sinicae, then you have to see whether the IOP is raised or not. If the IOP is raised, then it is a PAC of appositional type. And if the IOP is also not raised, then it is a PACS. And you have to document all your uh, findings into a, a goniogram which is important not only for medical legal con considerations, but also for follow-up, how the disease is progressing. There are various grading systems which can be taken from any of the standard textbooks. One should follow one of the systems and not confuse with all these systems that are there. So these are just case examples wherein we can see a very heavily pigmented uh, ang uh, angles, both superior and inferior in cases of pigmentary glaucoma, especially the inferior angle is se severely pigmented. Then you can see blood in uh, angle. You can see the wide, you can see here the ciliary body band is very wide. So it's a case of angle recession glaucoma. In uh, iridodialysis, normally you can see the root of the iris getting separated from the iris. In uh, cyclodialysis, you can see a cleft there, which is basically the, uh, the detachment of the ciliary body band from the insertion. Then in cases where you have the trabeclectomy has failed, you have to do a gonioscopy and see where is the pathology, where, whether it's the ostium that is closed or actually the iris is going and plugging and, you know, not allowing the ostium to function. And then you can uh, use it for various diagnoses like in cases of ice syndrome, you can see that there is a, a posterior amyrotoxin along with the corneo iridic additions. Emulsified oil in the sulcus many a times are missed because they are very fine globules iris melanomas, iris nevuses also. So what uh, important thing that all of you should know that being a contact procedure, it has to be sterilized and disinfected every after every use. The second part of my talk is on ASOCT. So ASOCT has a lot of uses, but fo uh, focusing only on the anterior segment and angle analysis. So in uh, for anterior segment analysis, it can, it can be used both qualitatively and quantitatively. The most important thing for us is to identify the scleral spur. This is the most important landmark, which is seen as a bump in the inner wall of the sclera. Once we mark this scleral spur, the, the, the software, the computer itself has a software which automatically calculates all the angle parameters, AOD, several T's, everything. These are built-in tools. So there are these uh, quantitative parameters that one can use for various uh, tools. And one more important thing is the ITC index, which is a quantitative measure of the extent of the angle closure across 360 degrees of the angle. And it expressed as percentage. So if you look at this uh, angle, you can clearly see that is a closure and the ITC index is 94%, meaning that there is a 94% closure, that is, there's a 94% contact. So these are various pre and post, uh, uh, pre and post uh, FACO uh, outcomes of the ITC, where, wherein initially it was nearly 98%, it has improved to 74%. So, and qualitatively we see that you can also see whether the angle is open, it is narrow or it is, uh, this is open, narrow and totally closed. And these are high definition uh, images of the angle where you can see actual uh, structures of the angle that are filtering. So this is one study from our center where we had taken cases of primary congenital glaucoma versus adult glaucomas. And we had seen that in cases of primary congenital glaucomas, there are actually membranes there which is covering the trabecular meshwork. So you also have a 360 degree view in this. And Doctor, this is can all you summarize please? Hello, we are time up. Okay. So, uh, so this is about uh, ASOCT. So, uh, just coming on to UBM. 
So at the end, I just want to say that uh, ASOC is a non-contact, 90 degree uh, patient setup and a precise scanning location versus UBM, which is a contact procedure. So this is how the machine looks like. There's a computer setup. There's a this is the probe, and uh, after anesthetizing the patient, patient has to lie supine. You have these cups, you have to put the fluid into it and then you use these probes which are 25 megahertz and 50 megahertz. For angle visualization we are using 50 megahertz and only a quadrant of the angle is seen. You can't see the 360 degree angles in this. So it only visualizes one part of the angle. What is the most advantage of this is that visualization of structures posterior to iris pigment epithelium including serially body can be done which cannot be done with the, that of ASOCT. Again similar to ASOT it has qualitative and quantitative estimation and there are various uh, examples. So the most importantly like what serially body want? cysts and iris I'll cysts call, are usually visualized in, with I this and serially body that. tumors also. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. At the end, I would like to say that imaging the anterior chamber angle is germane in understanding the angle anatomy and pathophysiology of various glaucomas. Gonioscopy is the gold standard. ASOCT being non-contact and a very uh, rapid procedure, it enhances the visualization of angle structures, provides 360 degree visualization of angles also. UBM is again a contact <coughs> procedure, but used for structures. To, to visualize structures posterior to iris pigment epithelium, including the ciliary body. And uh, I think at the end, I would like to say that multimodal imaging is useful in, uh, useful in decision making in complex anterior segment cases. Thank you. Thank you for the patient listening. Thank you, Dr. Devan.